Hey everyone, it's James Lindsay. You're listening to the New Discourses podcast. I got asked a question today that's going to make me do a little diversion. It's kind of related uh, to what I've been doing with the Critical Pedagogy uh, series. So those of you that are longtime listeners and avid followers of the podcast know that I'm in the midst of beginning to do a very long series on critical pedagogy, the critical turn in education, actually, so critical education theory. But I got asked today, you know, if I had a chance to just kind of tell people, in particular state legislators or school board uh, members or uh, maybe even super school superintendents, you know, maybe the top five things that I would say about critical race theory in education, what would I boil it down to? And it's, you know, it's very difficult to pick five things. So I picked five. And I'm actually just kind of going to go through those. Since it's the podcast, I'm not going to just limit myself to five. I will, for example, you know, I would point out to anybody that wants to deal with critical race theory that the first thing that I would actually tell them, and this is not on my list of the five, is that they're liars. And you must understand that critical race theorists are liars. And in that they are liars, they will lie about critical race theory and just about anything else to advance their agenda. They will lie about history. They'll lie about what they're doing. They'll lie about the budget. They'll lie about literally everything to keep advancing critical race theory. So we'll come back to that. <laughs> That's very important. But um, again, not on this list of five things that I'm going to kind of go into. Another one is that among the lies that they tell. So why would I bring up the lies? Because you need discernment to deal with these people. Okay. You have to be able to tell, like you actually have to know this stuff. I keep telling people this, the bitter pill of fighting critical theory is you actually have to know enough of it to know when it's being used and when you're being manipulated and lied to. That said, one of the ways that you get lied to is with the language that they use. So you need to have basically this really long list. I can't even do this list from memory. It changes all the time when I try to do it. I should write it down, I guess. But the list is so long. The list of kind of giveaway terms that tell you that critical race theory either is or very probably is present when it's not being called critical race theory, you know, with all the lies and everything else. Everybody's kind of aware that they're lying. They're saying there's no critical race theory. That's a graduate school. But everybody knows this is a lie. Everybody knows it's in the schools. Everybody knows that it's tucked into various programs that have other purposes as well, like social emotional learning and so on. But like, what are giveaway words? And I've, I've kind of latched on and my brain goes blank, but uh, to, to the word transformative, uh, you, people who want to do transformative want to transform society. That's Marxism. So critical race theory is probably there because critical race theory is the main Marxist tool they're using, especially in the schools. So is the queer and gender stuff, by the way, that's also Marxism in the schools. Uh, did a podcast on that recently, so you can check that out. But equity privilege. Those two words are dead giveaways. If they're talking about privilege and equity, yes. Yes, absolutely. Critical race theory is in the kind of cultural identity Marxism camp. And therefore, rather than focusing on materialism, which is, you know, material production, capital, etc., they're not trying to redistribute. Well, they, they are. They are interested in material redistribution, but less than they're interested in uh, what say, the educational theorist from the previous episode of the podcast, Michael Apple, called the politics of recognition, which is cultural assets, privilege redistribution. So if they're talking about privilege, they're talking about critical theory. They're talking about critical race theory, almost certainly, because racial privilege is going to be that. Whiteness is access to racial privilege. That means whiteness is the bourgeois cultural property that critical race theory seeks to abolish in exactly the same way Marx said that communism exists to abolish private property in the Communist Manifesto. This is pretty simple. Um, so if they're talking about privilege, you have to understand that, that, that they're trying, that, 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 that critical race theory is probably there. Privilege, I mean it, privilege, period. Privilege is the main thing these critical theories of identity, these cultural Marxist uh, theories of identity want to redistribute to different groups. And when it's been redistributed correctly, according to theory, 
and when it's been in addition to material resources being redistributed to a degree that's when you have equity so if you're having them to, if you're hearing the word equity and you're hearing the word privilege especially if it's connected to the word transformative or change transformative change to make children into change agents or any of this stuff you're definitely dealing with marxism of some modern contemporary variety which is probably going to include or be critical race theory diversity and inclusion that come along with equity also belonging those four words diversity inclusion equity and belonging are all in the same category you're probably dealing with critical race theory because diversity inclusion and belonging are not talked about outside of that context the connection to equity by the way is so deep that the definition even according to kendi if you don't use his stupid definition of racism but if you look at where he says what how do you stop inequality in his political article where he argues to make a a anti-racist constitutional amendment he says that inequity over a certain threshold is evidence of discrimination that means that systemic racism means inequity and the study of systemic racism is uh critical race theory and critical race theory being in its systemic study of racism means that it takes racism to work like a Marxian superstructure that has to be seen as a whole system that is an organizing principle for society that creates a stratification of society across which there is to be a conflict that's to awaken a lower class in rebellion against the upper class so that it can be overturned into a managed state of affairs like Kendi describes in his article that will be a so-called dictatorship of the anti-racist to riff off of Marx's dictatorship of the proletariat. So this is just straight Marxism at this point. So diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, transformative, change, change agent, privilege. These are dead giveaway words that you're dealing with critical race theory. Uh, I would tell you it goes further. Anything that sounds like a special, weird specialist woke term probably is one and critical race theory is probably in it culturally used as an adjective and for i guess it's an adverb in front of virtually anything probably critical race theory culturally responsive teaching culturally sustaining teaching culturally responsive education all of those kinds of things probably going to contain critical race theory ethnic studies almost certainly going to contain critical race theory because it's been co-opted by that if it wasn't that in the first place Anything that's focused overwhelmingly on culture, because this is a culturally identity Marxist program, cultural identity Marxism, critical race theory is a race component of a cultural identity Marxism, anything of that kind, dead giveaway. So if you see this world word culturally stuck in places, like attached to things, and you see the word systemic attached to things, where it seems weird, definitely going to have some critical race theory if they're talking about white supremacy like it's this thing outside of literally the clan or nazis probably going to have critical race theory involved um anything that's labeled white that seems weird to label white white mathematics white science white empiricism white tears white rage white fragility white privilege white comfort white uh silence uh white talk Lots and lots of these critical race theory gang, critical race theory, white awareness, white racial literacy, <laughs> racial attached to anything weird like literacy, critical race theory. So you need to have this litany of of terms where you just kind of are aware that these people use these ideas way too much in very specific ways. The big ones, of course, are privilege, equity, transformative, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion. I said equity twice there. Belonging, uh, change, transformative. I said transformative already. Uh, change agent. They're trying to make kids into change agents. Consciousness, a critical consciousness, a race consciousness, race literacy. literacy. You, how do you know all these? There's so damn many. Systemic anything. How do you know all these? Familiarity. You read their crap again and again and again and again and again. You read all that stupid boilerplate that the every institutional office is put out relentlessly for a year and a half every single bit of it just whatever they say that's all a woke agenda it is there if it's if you read a statement put out by in a major office of a major institution especially a university since george floyd died and if it mentions george floyd look for weird words that means critical race series there if you see it somewhere else critical race series probably there too so that's a rule of thumb that I would tell people. Now, the five things that I mentioned, and I kind of already dipped into these, one of these, uh, just to mention them very quickly, uh, see if I can summarize these and I'll actually go into them. The first one is that critical race theory is Marxism using race instead of class. Uh, 
The second one is that critical race theory teaches that racism that benefits white people is the fundamental organizing principle of society. These are things you should be, if I had five things to tell, say, a state legislature or a congressman or something in short, like 10 minutes to tell them what's critical race theory about. This is what I would cover. Third, critical race theory exists to create critical race theorists. Uh, Fourth, critical race theory believes that the explanation for all inequalities of outcome is racism, uh, understood through a Marxian lens. And fifth, critical race theory will co-opt everything into its one project of making more critical race theorists. So those are the five things in brief. Let me actually go into them, though. So number one, and I'll actually read it the way I phrased it in reply, which is critical race theory is Marxism that uses race instead of class. So its role in schools is the same as what Mao did when he created the Red Guard. That's in the Chinese Cultural Revolution. So, you know, if you're a listener to the podcast, or if you read my work, or if you're anticipating my forthcoming book called Race Marxism on the subject, you'll understand that when I say that critical race theory is race Marxism, which is a form of cultural identity Marxism, which is a cultural turn uh, of identity Marxism, which is a variation on neo-Marxism, which is an adaptation of cultural Marxism, which is a reinvention of Marxism. So it's all Marxism all the way down. I did a podcast on that recently. Uh, you'll know that I know what I'm talking about. Critical race theory, to quote Gloria Ladson Billings in her 1995 paper toward a critical race theory of education. She wrote that with William Tate IV. Critical race theory exists to make race the central construct for understanding inequality. So we're going to take Anywhere there's differences in outcome, we're going to center race as the explanation. That's what critical race theory is for. But that is the same as Marxism, and that's the tool that Marx used. We're going to look at any inequality. We're going to say that it's that it's uh, capitalist production is the cause for that instead of racism, and we're going to center that as the explanation for all inequality. Now we're just going to change class out, put in race, and we have race Marxism. And you can see the the discussion. Like I just talked about the difference between privilege and uh, you know cultural privilege, if you will, versus material privilege. Capitalism being in the bourgeoisie meant having cultural privilege. That has to be redistributed. We're going to seize the means of production. If we're Marxists, we're going to we're going to take those and we're going to what to do what with them. We're going to redistribute. We're going to create a dictatorship of the proletariat that's going to distribute these things according to Marxian theory so that it's more fair. Equal outcomes are going to be guaranteed. And now what we're going to do in critical race theory and these other cultural Marxism things, especially cultural identity Marxism, is that what we're going to do is we're going to actually seize the means of cultural production, and we're going to seize cultural privilege and redistribute that, how? Through cultural warfare. So you're going to get white people to shame themselves for their association with whiteness. You're going to get other races to shame themselves for their white adjacency or for selling out to whiteness or being whatever. And you're simultaneously going to agitate racial minority groups for uh, across the board, but especially the so-called BIPOC to um, see that that is the cause of their discontent so that you create a conflict across the line of stratification that's created around scapegoating whiteness, which whiteness means America, American values, Western values. That's all it means. Everything that's there is whiteness. It's been reframed by Cheryl Harris in 93 as a form of property. She has a paper from 1993, a law review paper called Whiteness as Property. So you understand it to be the bourgeois property that Marx is saying that we abolish. So we're literally critical race theory is race Marxism. It's that simple. It's extraordinarily simple. And the case will be in my book, my forthcoming book, Race Marxism, at close to 100,000 words. So you'll have plenty of time to get acquainted with it if you uh, end up picking up and reading that book. As for the Maoist part, though, that's more interesting. I'm not going to claim that I'm the super expert in in Mao yet. I've been reading a little bit, but I just don't have time. I have other projects that I'm embroiled in, and uh, I've picked up a little here and there. But one of the things I do know that that Mao did with his educational program to create the Red Guard, if you don't know what the Red Guard is, the Red Guard is the name basically for his student movement. Red means communist here. And he basically got students in grade school, high school, and university to turn on the old traditions and the older generations by radicalizing them through a crackpot education program. And the centerpiece of that crackpot education program was that it separated everybody into 10 classes. I don't know a ton about these 10 classes, but I know five were labeled black, and that's bad. 
and five were labeled red in the for communism, and that was good. Um, and so you can see then in this case that critical race theory would be like one that would 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 assign having the right racial politics and possibly aligning that racial politic with one's identity. Um, having the right political racial identity is going to put you in one of the red categories. Having queer identity is going to put you in a different red category. These are the good categories, according to Mao. So you're white, so you're always infected with whiteness because you automatically benefit from it. That's critical race theory. It's exactly like if you're in the capitalist class, you automatically benefit from capitalism, so you're automatically bourgeois and you have to be probably beaten to death or something. Well, here we have with uh, with racial <laughs> racial communism, we have this idea that, you know, the white kids can't possibly have the correct racial identity to have, you know, a red badge of honor being a red category. So they can be non-binary instead or gender fluid or trans or otherwise queer. And all of a sudden they have a red identity and you can go on down the line and all of the different factors. It's not just five we're not, you know, it's not this reductionist, but you've got racial category, sex category, gender category, sexual category, fat status, ability status, uh, immigration status, probably religious status to a degree. Everywhere they break down this privilege oppressed axis, the, being in the so-called oppressed group puts you in a red category. And so there's this high premium for young people to want to be in one of those so-called red categories going back. They don't call them that now. It's funny if you actually look on like the gender diagrams that they use to indoctrinate kids, though, in schools, they give them all colors. So like, you know, non-binary might be bisexual is like purple and non-binary might be like the turquoise, all these pretty colors. Being a straight cisgender person is gray. And so you can kind of see that they sort of literally do this. Um, gray being, you know, in the tint of, of uh, black spectrum. Then the black categories that were bad for Mao, these are the ones that have access to privilege. They were the rightist categories, the traditionalist categories, etc. And so within our schools, these are going to be white, straight, cisgender, which isn't even a word that means anything, um, male, etc. And you can see exactly how this reproduces that uh, conflict. And then the, the good red categories can go on to become the red guard when they're properly politically radicalized. So this is what critical race theory is. And these other identity Marxist tools like comprehensive sex education, gender theory, et cetera, are doing to the children. And part of the point of that is to sever the tie. First of all, it's to create these little revolutionaries that think in terms of critical consciousness of identity. But second of all, especially with the, the, queer theory stuff is going to be to sever the tie between this generation and the previous generation. You don't understand. Your generation tried to be colorblind for critical race or your generation. You didn't have to deal with all this non-binary. Everybody has their pronouns. You, parents, you just don't understand to the extreme. And to sever that link, the kid can't go to the parents to ask, what do I do about my non-binary status? And then they're going to get primed with a bunch of stuff like, we have to do this at school because your parents will probably reject you when you try to tell them that you're demisexual but aromantic or some total made-up nonsense. And... Uh, which is really just making academic, making some mental illness sound academic is really what all of that identity crap is. Uh, but anyways, you can see that this is a reproduction of Mao's program. And what's it for is to get them to want to throw away the old society. Mao, Mao's part was to destroy the four olds, but also to dis, to, 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 to break away from and actually hate and resent the older generation to reject that so they could usher in an entirely new culture with this new communist that's going to be led by these red guards who are the premium five red categories, especially the top level red and at the scapegoating uh, exclusion of the five black categories, which are now going to be all the uh, historically or traditionally or just normally so-called privileged, that's got quote, air quotes around it, um, categories. So what we have then, so just to summarize that one again, critical race theory is Marxism using race instead of class. So its role in the schools is the same as what Mao did to create his red guard and to foist the cultural revolution, which is what we are in the midst of. If you didn't know, we are in the midst of an American cultural revolution. It probably technically really got fully going. It's been ramping up for over a decade. It really got fully going when Trump just before Trump was elected or around Trump's election, his, it, when his, his candidacy, actually, I think 
was really the big one when he was selected as an RNC candidate, um, Republican Party candidate in 2016. Uh, and then it really went into a higher gear when George Floyd died. So that's point number one that I would tell uh, people if I had only a few minutes without, I mean, I wouldn't elaborate if I just had a few minutes quite this long, but welcome to the podcast. I elaborate here. Secondly, critical race theory teaches that racism that benefits white people, whether they like it or not, is the fundamental organizing principle of society and is therefore relevant to the different, to all difference and all inequality. Okay. So obviously I already explained these things, but I actually use this frequently as an operative definition of critical race theory. It appears in race Marxism in this, this form as well. Critical race theory teaches that racism that benefits white people, whether they like it or not, is the fundamental organizing principle of society. This is a Marxist belief that there's some kind of inequality, some kind of unfairness, some kind of injustice, some kind of something of this sort that society is organized all around that. Marx called it the capitalist superstructure. Uh, the cultural Marxists thought of it as bourgeois culture. Um, now we have whiteness in critical race theory and that this organizes society is literally organized. So around this idea and, um, you can't actually escape it. If you are, if you have access to whiteness, you benefit from whiteness. Therefore you, uh, whether you like that or not about yourself and you can see what's going to happen with the self depreciating shame and, and the self hate and all of that and how that's going to be politically actionable to put you into a, a morally diminished, demoralized, really, I should say state. Um, if you have access to that privilege, then you are part of the problem and you are by your very nature participating in upholding the problem. And you can read this from Barbara Applebaum's rather crazy, uh, being white, being good which is this 2010 book about white moral complicity. Um, and she says explicitly in that book many times, and it's been quoted on New Discourses, other people have quoted it, Chris Rufo's quoted it uh, on his site. We've gathered the quotes and disseminated them. We've read them out loud. We've put them on air. They're in race Marxism. Uh, when you'll see that, she says explicitly many times that all white people, by virtue of the fact that they benefit from this superstructure of white racism, are racist because whiteness is seen or racism is seen to be that benefits white people is seen to be the fundamental organizing principle of society. So whiteness becomes a superstructure and its effect is white supremacy and white racism. As I already said, according to Ibram Kendi, uh, it's therefore relevant to all difference that well, that's Gloria Lads and Billings and all inequality actually and Kendi both. So that's a fundamental tenant of critical race theory. As a matter of fact, this is just boiling down the fu first fundamental tenant of critical race theory, which is that racism is the ordinary state of affairs in society. It's so-called normal science, according to Delgado and Stefanczyk in their book titled critical race theory and introduction. Um, so this is, this is a, you have to understand. So critical race theory is that it believes that white racism or racism that benefits white people, whether they like it or not is how society is organized. There's this very famous book. So just, just to kind of touch on this one author, Charles Mills, there's this famous book that he wrote, one of the most influential books. And in, I'm told it's not critical race. Theory. I'm told it's a critical philosophy of race. Cause you know, the, the very different, obviously, so they can fuck off with that. But, um, like they think they're tricking people with that. Like, seriously, are you kidding me? Are you freaking kidding me? But yeah, critical philosophy of race, Charles Mills. He recently died. Um, I'm told he's a very nice man. turns out he's a communist and a racist, but very nice, apparently very professional, very kind, whatever. Uh, but he recently died and Charles Mills wrote a book in 1997 called the racial contract. The racial contract reproduces Rousseau's social contract, which is this idea that we all agree to the kind of rules of society by some kind of a, you know, invisible contract, whether we know it or not. So we have duties that we have to uphold, et cetera. But the racial contract is a explicitly critical race theory version of this a critical philosophy of race version of this that says that all white people conspire without ever telling one another. It's the biggest conspiracy theory in the entire universe. It's a magic conspiracy theory that nobody conspires, but everybody's a conspirator. Nobody's ever told anybody about it, but all white people by virtue of white privilege conspire to keep white people up and all racial minorities down. And there's an entire book, like I said, the racial contract that makes the case that this is how society is actually organized. In other words, it's the fundamental organizing principle of society. What is 
racism that benefits white people. Charles Mills, in light of the first of these points that I mentioned, that critical race theory is Marxism using race instead of class in 2011, 2000 something later, after the 90s, wrote another book called From Class to Race, where he details how uh, Marxism transitioned from class to race in the form of critical race theory, when he characterizes Marxism as white Marxism. So Charles Mills lays it all out for us, points numbers one and two here. So the second point here then, you have to understand, if you want to understand what critical race theory is, is that society is fundamentally organized by racism that benefits white people, whether they like it or not, whether they're aware of it or not, they're automatically complicit. And it is therefore relevant, and this is a, just a moment to linger on this, therefore relevant to all difference in outcomes and all inequality or all inequity, really. And like I said, Kendi says this and Gloria Ladson Billing says this. It is the critical race theory exists to center race as the central construct for understanding inequality. That's Ladson Billings. Uh, Ladson Billings. And anyway, that's what this is. But what that means is critical race theory exists to find racism in everything and to say everything that doesn't go the way that the critical race theorists want it to go. It's going to find racism in it, and uh, that's going to be taken as causative for those differences. And so another characterization of critical race theory that's not on my list but should be is that critical race theory literally just means calling everything you want to control racist until you control it. That's all it means. Critical race theory is just the, we'll say, art of calling everything that you want under your control racist until it's under your control. If it's partially under your control, you call it racist more until it's more under your control. So what that means is that critical race theory in practice means thinking that race is relevant to everything. Racism is present in everything. It needs to be found and interrogated, and you're going to call everything racist until it conforms exactly to your views as a critical race theorist. So it's just calling everything that you wish you had control over calling it racist until you have total control over it. So you should understand this. Then do you really want this in the schools? Do you want to teach kids to think that way? That if you just, if you see something in the world that you wish you could have command over, all you have to do is go call it racist until everybody backs off and you have total control over how it's going to go. Every social phenomenon, interaction, relationship, etc. Just point out the racism that you made up there. Say that it came from your feelings, so you can't possibly be wrong. It's totally subjective in that sense. And you're off to the races and you can control it. So that's the second point. Third point that I would share, critical race theory exists specifically to make more critical race theorists at the expense of everything else. So this kind of blends in with point number five. So, you know, I could, I can do these together, but I won't, I'll come back to it. But that also says that, you know, calling everything racist that you want to control until you control it is also, you know, if we change five to six, one of the key points I would say is just calling things racist until you control them constantly from a subjective perspective that can't be challenged or questioned. So nonsense. Um, structural determinism, we could go into the whole thing, but we're not going to. So critical race theory exists specifically to make more critical race theorists at the expense of everything else. So the key part of this, we'll get uh, the, the at the expense of everything else is point number five. So I'm not going to elaborate on that point here. You have, must understand if you're thinking about critical race theory being in the schools, you say, well, what's it for? They say, oh, it's honest history. It's, oh, it's real rec reckoning with our history. It's honest conversations about race, blah, blah, blah. No, it isn't. It is the attempt to raise racial consciousness. When you have a racial consciousness raised, your racial consciousness, you are now a critical race theorist. So critical race theory exists to raise racial consciousness. When you have racial consciousness, you are a critical race theorist. Therefore, simple syllogism, critical race theory exists to make critical race theorists. That's it. That's all it does. It's all it knows how to do. I've talked at length before about why this is the case. They believe as a fundamental belief system in their critical race theory religion that if you have enough critical race theorists, critical race theorists will be put into power. They will usher society into a racial utopia called racial justice, just like it, which is a direct racial parallel of communism. And that will be achieved by an administered state of close to of approximated racial justice called racial equity. You can see the, the structure here. Equity is like socialism. 
justice is like communism and they believe that if they can administer that and long enough then you get it and how do you get to administer it you have enough critical race theorists so that people will let critical race theorists be in power and then everybody will be forced to be a critical race theorist or probably be starved or dead and then it'll work because magic of communism and that's literally what's going on here so their only objective is to make more critical race theorists and i said the point of critical race theory is to raise a racial consciousness which is a shorthand for what you could also call racial literacy which is shorthand for critical consciousness of race but a critical consciousness is the revamping into the neo-marxist framework of class consciousness class consciousness isn't enough that was Marx's idea, that if you're aware that you're in the proletariat of the bourgeoisie, then you can become class conscious. You can then engage properly in your role within the class struggle. Uh, you can adopt whichever side that you're going to do, and then you have the struggle, and then communism and socialism and so on will, will follow. Here, we're talking about doing the same thing with race in place of class. So you now have a racial consciousness or racial literacy or cultural competence of race uh, racial cultural competence, racial sensitivity, all brought into the picture. When those are raised, you properly, you are a critical race theorist because otherwise you didn't get the correct one. Why? That's where structural determinism comes back into this picture. It is believed in critical race theory through a doctrine called structural determinism, but also from the older Marxist idea of material determinism, that your cultural conditions, specifically that race has been imposed upon you and is a power dynamic in which it oppresses you if you're a racial minority. In other words, if you don't have access to whiteness, um, then you have had a your character itself, your thoughts, your ideas, your view of the world, etc., have been conditioned by living in that state of oppression, so that only the critical race theory articulation of that state of oppression could possibly be the authentic one. They think that they have cracked the code of racial oppression, and they have the only correct explanation. And anybody who deviates from that explanation is actually uh, buying into whiteness. They're actually somehow corrupt. They're actually acting white, uh, seeking white reward, something like this, white adjacent. So the goal is to raise critical race consciousness, which is the par direct parallel of class consciousness, which it, switched to critical consciousness during the neo-Marxist era because they neo-Marxists basically believe that the capitalists are too tricksy and uh, that they... Consumerism and capitalism are actually brainwashing people to keep participating in believing what the, the point of critical consciousness is to be, that the capitalist enterprise is brainwashing people into believing that it gives them a good life. And in fact, it's also brainwashing them into thinking that communism is a bad idea and that a critical consciousness, therefore, is, is able to see through this introjection by the heteronymous interests, as Herbert Marcuse would have it, who was kind of this arch neo-Marxist of the 1950s and 60s. Um, and, and critical consciousness means being aware that the capitalist system is brainwashing you, right? So, so class consciousness is being aware of which class you're in, bourgeoisie or proletariat, and then what that means politically for you. Critical consciousness is believing that there's a vast conspiracy of the entire capitalist society to brainwash you into not realizing that capitalism is actually terrible. And critical consciousness means being able to see through that. So it's way bigger than, it's way more conspiratorial in Fruit Loops and paranoid than Marxist class consciousness. And then racial consciousness is the same thing with race in place of class or race in place of uh, racism in place of capitalism. And so, yet again, we see the same theme, uh, theme and thesis being reproduced again and again. So critical race theory exists, point number three, specifically to make more critical race theorists at the expense of everything else. And like I said, we'll come back to that in point five. That's a really big deal. First, we will do point four. However, critical race theory believes the explanation for all inequalities of outcome by race is or overwhelmingly includes racism. I know that that's a bit redundant to the organizing principle of society. I don't have a lot to explain there, but I'm sorry, critical race theory is not complicated. It's not deep. We could talk about structural determinism in some depth, but it's really kind of dumb. Uh, we could talk about any of its tenets in some depth, like narratives and storytelling and why storytelling, but it's all really just self-serving dumb crap. It's, uh, critical theories in general, critical race theory in particular, are really good at making themselves look deep. So you can like, imagine like a great lake. It's a huge lake, right? 
but it's literally about as deep as a mud puddle. I'm never been, I don't know, but I think if I'm not mistaken, I know we're all going to laugh like beavers and butthead, but Lake Titicaca, if I'm not mistaken, if I've said that correctly, um, is like 10 feet deep or something like that at its deepest place, but it's this huge lake. And so it's like that, except even shallower and even broader because critical research believes really it would be like a lake that covers the entire surface of the earth about a centimeter deep because it believes it touches everything, but there's literally never any depth. There's a problem, racism. There's something I don't control, racism. That's really all critical race theory is. It's that simple. I spent three freaking years reading all this crap to understand it at all of its depth, get all of the nuance of their arguments, and I can conclude that that's, that's it. It's just call everything racist that you want to control. So if there's an inequality that it cares about, racism must be the cause of it. That's critical race theory. Racism is the uh, explanation for all inequality, all differences in outcomes of the kinds that they care about. So when Asians outperform whites, that's actually Asians by, because according to critical race theory, Asians being non-white should not be able to outperform white. So it must mean that they've bought into whiteness and received white reward and white acceptance, and even maybe been designated as white or white adjacent. Why? Because they have values that align with, like I said, Western or American values in many cases. Turns out the Confucian ethic is different than the Western ethic, but they actually have profound parallels. For example, uh, to draw off the Chinese exam- uh, example, hard work, punctuality, things that people are, you know associate with success because they are success generators are deemed whiteness because they're like American values, etc. So uh, Asians must be conspiring somehow through their own little model minority racial contract to buy into that. And to their own benefit while throwing all other racial minorities under the bus. So it's still white racism <laughs> perpetrated by Asians, but per- perpetrated by white people who let the Asians get away with it for whatever set of particularly bad reasons, model minority, Asia, Asian fetishism, yada, 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 whatever gross thing they want to try to accuse people of. So I guess we could throw in as far as this kitchen sink goes that critical race theory can read your mind and your uh, and, and your intentions, and they can conclude that your intentions for whatever you did were the worst possible motivation you could have that always has something to do with racism. That's another articulation of the same point. So a famous example, though, of this fourth point that I have given so many times, I'll give it again. Uh, it's always worth hearing this again. A critical race theory would analyze so that racism is always present. Imagine you own and operate a store. I just recently went and bought a suit. Fancy me. I understand that therefore the guy selling me the suit had to take time to work with me individually. So, you know, imagine we're in a store like that, but you're working alone. You work alone. Two people come in at once, one white, one black. It's going to take five or 10 minutes to work with each customer. They come in so close at the same time. You don't know who came in first. You don't have any heuristic to decide who you should pick. It's a total coin flip 50-50 chance if done at random. Who you pick to help first? Who do you choose? If you pick the white person, obviously critical race theorists would say that was racism that motivated your decision because racism is the ordinary state of affairs. The question is not did racism take place, but how did racism manifest in a situation according to Robin D'Angelo? And uh, you were racist in this case by picking the white person because you see black people as second class citizens who should have to wait and you're going to serve the white person first. Maybe you pick the black person instead. Well, a couple of ways a critical race theorist, depending on how paranoid and wackadoodle they want to be, could analyze why this was racist to pick the black person first. One is that you think that black people are more likely to steal or whatever. And so you're going to help the black person first to get them out of the store and make sure they're never wandering around for five or 10 minutes unattended in your store because you're a racist and have racist beliefs about black people. Secondly, it could even, they, they, they can go so far into your, your intentions to determine how evil you are by, uh, that, that they might even say, and this is literally something they might argue that you actually, because you're a racist and prefer white people, you wanted to help the white person, but you wanted to hide that fact by helping the black person first. So you only helped the black person to hide the fact that you wanted to help the white person because you were a racist. Those are critical race theory analyses of that circumstance. Is that valuable to teach children to think that way? Mm-hmm. Not so much. No, not so much. And so that's a pretty good articulation or example of how critical race theory will find racism at the heart of every explanation for every possible phenomenon you can imagine, even phenomena that are uniracial, like it's you and three other people of your race, and it literally doesn't matter what your race is, hanging out. There's racism present. Why? Because let's suppose you're all for white. Well, it's because you excluded 
minority races from hanging out with you. You didn't do the work to make sure they felt included and would be welcome, so you were racist. Or, on the other hand, suppose you're not white, maybe you're all four black. Well, it's racist because, obviously, you're hanging out together one another because white society had excluded you in that regard. The only exception to this example would be still uncovering racism, which is uh, to say that you are for racially awakened racial minorities who are hanging out together uh, specifically as a means of um, finding racial solidarity and escaping whiteness, or if you're for white people because you're aware that it might cause um, racial oppression to bring uh, whiteness into a space otherwise occupied by people of color. So racism is the bottom of literally everything for critical race theorists. This is the this is the tendentious, tortured, racist analysis that's at the heart of this. So it's pre- probably pretty important to understand that this is actually how critical race theory analyzes literally everything. And you have to racialize everything under critical race theory. Terrible thing to be teaching. Do you want that in your schools? Do you want that centered in your schools? No. And if you remember that it exists only to make more critical race theorists at the expense of everything else, which we're going to turn to now in point number five, you understand what a catastrophe that is. Point number five, critical race theory bends all curricula. So now we're very specifically in schools. It actually bends all resources, no matter where you are, whether you're in, if you're at a church, whether you're in a business, it doesn't matter. But in a school, it's going to be curriculum. Uh, critical race theory bends all curricula to teaching critical race theory. Why? Because it exists only to make more critical race theorists, to raise critical consciousness of race. So critical race theory bends all curricula to teaching critical race theory through aspects of that subject matter, say even math. So for example, a mathematics lesson might, rather than covering the XY coordinate plane, when this is a real example from the Critical Race Theory Handbook of Education, a uh, chapter written by, uh, by the activist educator Daniel Solorzano. Um, he gives the example of the XY coordinate axis. This is a basic algebra lesson about plotting functions, understanding the relationship between a dependent and independent variables. And um, it, they give an example where students are struggling to learn. Functions are hard. I've taught algebra functions. People struggle with functions. People actually do struggle also with the XY coordinate plane, vertical axis having the uh, dependent variable, the horizontal axis having the independent variable typically. And um, people struggle to learn it. It's difficult. So they, uh, they give an example where the teacher has written an email to Daniel Solorzano is telling the story and says, my students were struggling with this. And then I showed them, well, imagine, and I don't remember which one it is. One of the axes, we'll say the horizontal axis is commitment to social justice. And the other axis is racial literacy or, you know, racial consciousness or whatever. And then we had a great conversation talking about, you know, where people would land, you know, should you have high commitment to social justice and high, uh, high levels of racial literacy, where, where, what about people who have low or negative? And we had a great conversation that way, blah, blah, blah. But the lesson is no longer about mathematics, and it's certainly not about functions. It's certainly certainly not about the relationship between the dependent and independent variables um, or what algebra is actually about in that regard. It's now about, or graphing functions in general, it's, it's not a lesson about that. It's now a lesson about, you know, with plotting points, I guess, being the only sort of pseudo mathematical, interesting thing. It's now a lesson about social justice and what it means to be or critical race theory. So every bit of curriculum is going to get bent to that. So when I said earlier in point number three, that at the expense of everything else, I really meant that I meant that whatever the other thing is, whether it's math instruction, reading instruction, writing instruction, science instruction, whatever, it's all going to be retooled to become critical race theory and social justice instruction in order to create more critical race theories. So All resources in a critical race theory paradigm are going to be bent to the one purpose of critical race theory, which is to make more critical race theorists. So I recently was asked, what's the biggest tragedy of critical race theory in schools? Is it the division between the kids, the racial uh, consciousness, the fact that they're thinking in terms of race instead of getting away from that? And I said, no, it's none of that. It's none of that. It's the learning loss. We talk about learning loss with the pandemic and the distance learning and all of this. No, the learning loss from critical theory and education is unbelievable. Uh, Why? Because the curriculum has been 
diverted every minute of instruction time that's not actually about algebra now, but is instead about using some algebraic concept to talk about critical race theory is a moment that is, is a minute that wasn't spent teaching algebra, which is already hard enough. So there's a tremendous learning loss. Is it any surprise that our schools have such failing literacy rates, mathematics rates, science literacy rates, etc.? Reading and writing are out. No, because they're teaching them critical social theory instead and using other subjects as the vehicle. So when you want to talk to people, say, in school boards or superintendents or legislators or whatever about the impact that critical race theory is going to have in schools, the number one thing you should be talking about is the tremendous learning loss, the opportunity cost of teaching critical theory in place of teaching actual uh, worthwhile skills, reading, writing, arithmetic, uh, other mathematics, science, coding, like actual useful skills, to find basic financial literacy, all these kinds of things that would be beneficial to government civics, foreign language, things that would actually be beneficial that you might teach in schools at different grades and different levels being replaced with just more social justice, critical theory, garbage. And the learning loss that occurs is measurable and visible. I won't, I won't go so far as to say if we track you know, educational outcomes over the last 40 years, and we see the tremendous drop in literacy rates and failures in our schools, tremendous drops in, in scientific and mathematical quality uh, over the years. Now you have to be careful because test teaching to the test has, in, has created inflated numbers and, and it's difficult to parse this out, but it's, it's unambiguous. The number of uh, adult Americans coming out of high school who cannot read or that are functionally illiterate, if not fully illiterate, uh, has been going up. And so... The utter failure of our schools. I don't. I wouldn't say that all of this has been by t replacing actual construction with critical theory. Probably the stupid self-esteem movement, where nobody ever gets a bad grade, and nobody's ever to feel bad, and grade inflation, etc., have all played their part uh, as well. But and these are all kind of connected ideas and problems. But they're not all critical theory. But this learning loss by replacing subject matter history is one that I didn't mention, but it's really badly infected. Uh, Replacing history, subject matter with critical theory of subject matter or critical theory through subject matter uh, is a significant, huge, huge, huge cost of this crap. And given its way, because critical race theorists, <laughs> as a rule, they're not very good at math, um, critical race theorists would replace literally all curriculum. And this is what you see in, say, Washington, Oregon, and California with their ethnomathematics and their critical uh, race theory approach to mathematics. It was very famous throughout the media all last year and this year too. Uh, this is what you see is that if they had their way, they would replace all instruction with using whatever subject we're going to, we're going to talk about mathematics as a means to talk about social justice and critical race theory. And so that fifth point then is that all of the, every bit of your resources in whatever institution school whatever, are going to be re diverted into making critical race theorists. In other words, to teaching critical race theory concepts. They may not teach critical race theory in the strict legal sense or teaching you specifically what the theory is, but teaching critical race theory means raising a, a racial consciousness by one means or another. And that's the only thing that it does. That's the only thing critical race theory exists to do. So I guess just to summarize here at the end, then I'll open this back up and reread these five points. Um, but these are the five things. If I had to summarize quickly, what would I tell somebody if I had a few minutes to tell them what does critical race theory, what's this, what's the problem with it in schools? Uh, in addition to telling them they've got to learn to watch the language and you have to become savvy with it. In addition to warning them that critical race theorists are liars. In addition to, uh, pointing out that, uh, Critical race theory basically means calling everything racist until you control it um, utterly. I would tell them the, the five things I wrote down, at least in this answer that I sent out into the world. One, critical race theory is Marxism that uses race instead of class. So its role in schools is the same as what Mao Zedong did in China to create his Red Guard during the Chinese Cultural Revolution. Two, critical race theory teaches that racism that benefits white people, whether they like it or not, also whether they recognize it or not, is the fundamental organizing principle of society and is therefore relevant to all differences and inequalities and inequity. Three, critical race theory exists specifically to make more critical race theorists at the expense of everything else. Four, critical race theory believes the explanation for all inequalities of outcome relevant to race 
is or, over, or overwhelmingly includes racism as the cause. And five, critical race theory bends all curricula to teaching critical race theory through aspects of that subject matter, even mathematics. So those are some big hot button points that people who are looking at critical race theory in the schools need to understand. Where I had to add a little bit more, one thing I would very cheerfully tell everybody is you're not going to get it out as easily as you hope. It will not leave without a fight. This is an ideology, critical race theory is an ideology concerned wholly with power and how race and power are intertwined. So it is wholly concerned with gaining its own and maintaining its own power because it believes that anybody or anything else having power is an application of the exact thing it exists to stop. One of the beliefs of critical race theory through interest convergence and that organizing principle thing, these are other tenets of critical race theory, is that racism doesn't get better over time. It, in fact, only teaches itself to hide itself better. So critical critical race theory believes that racism doesn't, there's no racial progress. There's either racial revolution or there's not. Critical race theory does not believe that racial progress is occurring. It, in fact, thinks that racism is getting worse. So racism in 2020 or 21 or 98 or whatever you want, 1998, is worse than it was, say, in 1840. Why? Because it's the exact same racism now hidden better. Everything that was happening before we uh, abolished slavery all that racism is still occurring just as bad as always. It's just hidden better, harder to see, requires a more intense critical theory. So it's a very pessimistic, cynical theory in that regard as well um, of, of race and racism. So, but this is, this is the summary I would give of critical race theory. And I would tell people that this is obviously utter poison. And the point that I was making with that was that if you think that way, you're not going to let go of any power that you have whatsoever, because Anybody else teaching anything is just hiding racism again and entrenching racism again and making sure that the so-called racial status quo of the, which means the existing system, which means whiteness doesn't get abolished and go away. So now, you know, a little bit more about critical race theory. You can spend an hour listening to this. You can write down those points. You can communicate those points. You can actually just say those points in about a minute, minute and a half. You can actually write those fo- those points down in on a note card or two, easily show them to somebody. You can easily add a small, if you wanted to, write them down, write a small paragraph explaining them in your own words, publish it, whatever, I don't care. Put some credit if you want, link to the podcast. But you should actually have a deeper understanding. And if you have somebody who has an hour to listen to my explanations of these things so they can get a little bit deep and hear that I'm not making any of it up, um, now you've got this to offer them. So I hope it's been helpful. Soon we will be back to our critical pedagogy adventure, which is going to be an extraordinarily long and broad and deep dive into this, I think. Um, We'll pick up next time with that. Thanks for listening. 